Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can you all hear me clearly? Okay, I will upload the slides so we can start. Okay, so today we will do chapter 6. Okay. Uh, this chapter is about the proposals uh, for classroom teaching. We have six different proposals or six different approaches for uh, how to teach language in a classroom. Uh, number one is called Get It Right From The Beginning. Number two is just listen and read. Number three, let's talk. Four, get two for one. Five, teach what is teachable. And the last one is get it right at the end or in the end. We will look at uh, each one of these and we see what are uh, the pros and cons of each proposal. Yeah, I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Kibo. Okay. Um, to assess these proposals, uh, research was done on uh, each of them. Um, so as we said before, we have two types of research. We have the quantitative research and the qualitative research. The quantitative research is descriptive or experimental. So they just look at or observe what is going on and what happens in the classroom and they describe um, what is happening. Uh, and it's also experimental where they group the students or the learners and try to apply different um, techniques, um, testing and observing techniques on them so they can evaluate um, the proposal they are using. So the goal of the quantitative research is to identify specific variables that may affect learning similarly in different contexts. And uh, it is always or it often involves large numbers in order to draw conclusions about learners in general. So with the quantitative research, 
they use a big number of the learners. So at the end, when they draw conclusions, they can um, generalize their results. OK, the other type of research is the qualitative research. Um, it is mainly descriptive uh, or ethnographies or case studies. Uh, the emphasis is um, not on experiments, but the emphasis is on a thorough understanding of what is particular about a classroom or uh, a learner. Uh, sorry, I have to excuse, and I'll be back in a few seconds. Okay, so as we said, the emphasis of the qualitative research is uh, on a thorough understanding of what is particular about a classroom or a learner. So we are talking about a small number, concentrating on a small number of learners. It could be only one class, and sometimes it's a case study of only one or two learners. Another type of research is called the action uh, research. And this is carried out by the teachers themselves. OK, so not independent researchers, but the teacher himself uh, will try to see how effective the method he is using on his learners. Uh, so uh, it is very essential to answer specific and local questions, something that is related to the class he is teaching. Now, let's start with the first proposal for teaching second language. The first one is, get it right from the beginning. OK, this approach depends on grammar translation. Right, what do we mean by grammar translation approach? Um, it's an approach that emphasizes uh, the importance of written language, rule learning, translating literary works. OK, you can relate this to uh, the old way of teaching English in Saudi Arabia in government schools, where what they teach is grammar, grammatical rules. They teach the students how to write, how to spell words, and how to write correct sentences, grammatical sentences. And they use lots of translation between L1 and L2. Uh, a modification of that approach is called the audiolingual approach, where the emphasis is an oral language, repetitive drill, and memorization. <coughs> Usually these two approaches go together, where they teach grammar, and uh, when they want to teach uh, listening or speaking, they depend mainly uh, on repeating uh, certain sentences or say certain phrases and memorize these phrases and when to use them. So there is no much processing of the language. It depends on memorization and repeating uh, till the learner uh, gets the rules. Uh, well, there was some research uh, to assess this approach. Uh, but actually, the number of research done here is uh, not a big number. Um, most of these approaches were ap applied, as we said, on ordinary school programs. Okay, So this is a very uh, old method uh, of teaching second language. Uh, and you can see that from the date of the, of the research. It's in 1983 and 1972. So we're talking about very old methods of teaching uh, second language. Um, one of the research was a descriptive study done by Lifebound 
um, on interlanguage development in audiolingual pattern uh, drill uh, in a high school. Another study was done by uh, Savignan in 1972. It was an experimental study of learning in audiolingual instruction with or without communicative practice, but that was on the level of university uh, uh, university uh, learners. Okay, so what were the results? What did they find out after um, looking at this approach and testing the students? Is it effective or not? They found out that learners who receive audiolingual or grammar translation instruction are often unable to communicate effectively outside the classroom. So they are doing well uh, in tests and exams and in activities during uh, the uh, or inside the classroom, but they are not able to use the language effectively outside the classroom in a natural setting. Um, exclusively structure-based approaches to L2 teaching do not prevent learners from making developmental errors when using language spontaneously. So they found that even they know the rules, even the learners memorized the rules, but still they make developmental errors when they use the language uh, naturally or spontaneously. So obviously this approach, this old method of teaching language um, is not effective because the learners cannot use the language freely in a natural uh, setting. Uh, this approach is based on uh, the behaviorist uh, theory. Okay, where they think that it's a habit, they have to repeat a lot, so uh, they, it becomes a habit of using the language. But obviously, it's not a very successful approach. Okay, the second proposal, or the second way of teaching uh, language is, is we, we call it here just listen and read. So from the name, we can see that it concentrates on listening and reading. So we are talking about the input of the language, not the output. They concentrate on the input. Okay. Um, this approach is based in part on the comprehensible input hypothesis. Remember Krashen? We talked about his theory before, and we said that he believes that acquisition occurs when comprehensible input is available. So the emphasis is on providing comprehensible input through listening and or reading activities. So based on Krashen's theory uh, or hypothesis of comprehensible input, that if we provided the learners with uh, a level of the language that they can understand with a little bit of extra um, information to challenge him, uh, they will succeed in learning uh, the language. Uh, Krashen believes that it, does n it is not necessary to drill and memorize language forms in order to learn them. So they don't believe in drills and memorization like uh, the first proposal. It is not necessary to produce language, so they are not concerned with the output. If the learner can speak or can write, they are not concerned with these two skills. They believe that we should give a good input uh, that the learner understands, and then the learner by himself will process the language, and eventually he will be able to use it. Again, research was done to evaluate how successful this approach, just listen and read. Um, so uh, comprehension-based instruction by Life Down in 2002, reading for words by Horst in 2005, input flood, uh, enhanced input, and processing 
uh, instruction. You can see that uh, some of the research is, uh, are relatively uh, recent, not like the first one. Okay, so what is the result of this research? Is it effective, this proposal of just listen and read? Well, they found that learners can make considerable progress if they have sustained exposure to language they understand. So if they were exposed to comprehensible input for uh, a long time, they will uh, make a big progress. Comprehension-based comprehension learning is an excellent way to begin learning and is a valuable supplement to other kinds of learning for more advanced learners. Right, is it effective? Yes, it is effective, but only in the beginning. So it's a very good way to start uh, teaching the language for the beginners. But after um, advanced, when they reach an advanced uh, level, they, of course, need more. So this approach can be used um, to support another approach in advanced levels. Okay? Uh, well, you're asking where you can study uh, this. Uh, well, if you need more explanation, if you need uh, an extended, uh, extended details about these uh, studies, you will find them, of course, in the book. Here, this is just a summary of uh, the important points. Uh, so, what you need to know, you need uh, to know what is each proposal, uh, what does it emphasize on, and then what is the result of the research, is it effective or not. Okay, this is what you need to know about each uh, proposal. Okay, uh, however, comprehensible input alone is not sufficient for L2 learning. So it is a good tool. It is, it is a good supplementary method, but it should not be the main uh, method, not alone. It has to be used besides something, uh, besides another proposal or another approach. Uh, Input-based instruction is most effective when it includes guided learning as well as listening, reading for meaning. So there must be some kind of guidance and instructions because they believe that uh, just give the, the learner the input, just give him uh, enough listening and reading and he will progress by himself. He will learn um, the rules, the pronunciation, the well, whatever, he will get it by himself. But uh, the research found out that it's not enough alone. You need some guidance, you need instructions, you need teaching uh, more than that. Okay, evidence from input-based learning led Swain in 1985 to propose the comprehensible output hypothesis. So in 1985, uh, researcher Swain um, came up with comprehensible output hypothesis. So, uh, using this hypothesis will make us concentrate also in producing the language, in read, uh, not only listening and reading, but also writing and speaking. Okay, the third approach for teaching second language is called Let's Talk. So, to, um, to improve the second proposal, which is just listen and read, they came up with this approach where they make the learners or they concentrate on uh, the learner's uh, production of language. So instead of concentrating on the input, they're concentrating on the output, so comprehensible output hypothesis. Um, 
it suggested that learners develop when they must produce the language. So uh, pushing the students or the learners to produce language, whether it was in speaking or in writing, will make them improve and it will make their language develop more. Um, with the comprehensible output hypothesis, they use the interaction hypothesis that emphasize the role of conversational interaction. So not only input, they are not only listening, but they must engage in um, conversation. So they listen, they understand, and then they reply, and they listen again and reply again. So this interaction, this conversational interaction, uh, is the key to develop their language. Uh, also, learners negotiate for meaning to express and clarify their thoughts in a way that leads to mutual comprehension. So they they have to um, negotiate for meaning in a way uh, they try to go around uh, whatever they have or whatever they uh, know about the language to deliver the message, to make the other person understand what they want to say. So this is what we call negotiate for meaning, giving more explanation, giving um, description or maybe going around to explain or to get their message through. So, how does negotiation for meaning work? According to the interaction hypothesis, negotiation leads learners to acquire the words and grammatical structures to express their intended meaning. So how do they negotiate for meaning? There is more than one way. One is requests for clarification. So when uh, the learner doesn't understand what the other person is saying, or maybe the other person would ask for, what did you mean? What, or what does that mean? Okay, so they ask for clarification. Can you please explain this to me? So when the other person is asking for clarification, it forces or it pushes the learner to express more, to use the language more, to try to get uh, the message to the other person. Another way of negotiation for meaning is request for confirmation. So uh, the person would ask, uh, the learner, uh, something like, uh, so you mean this, right? Okay, so is that what you want to say? So this is asking for confirmation um, to make sure that he got the message, right? Uh, repetition with rising intonation. So uh, sometimes the, the learner would say a sentence or a phrase, and then the other person would repeat exactly the same uh, phrase, but with a rising intonation. Uh, something like the learner would say, um, I go shopping yesterday. So the other person would say, you went shopping yesterday? Okay, so this is repetition with rising intonation. Okay, so all of these techniques uh, where uh, they negotiate for meaning can help them acquire different words and different grammatical structures to express their meaning. So, uh, how successful is this approach? where they have to interact and uh, they have to produce language and to negotiate for meaning, right? How much is it successful in teaching uh, the second language? Um, again, a number of research studied how effective it is. Uh, one of them is learners talking to learners. 
uh, learner language and proficiency level, the dynamics of pair work, interaction and L2 development, learner-learner interaction in, Thai, uh, in a Thai classroom. So all of these studies or all of these research um, studied this proposal, let's talk, uh, to see how effective it is in teaching a second language. So what's the result? What did they find? They found that learners can develop fluency and communication abilities in conversational interaction. So it is working, it is effective that the learners become fluent, especially in communication and conversation. Okay, it is difficult for learners to provide each other with accurate corrective feedback in conversational interaction. Remember, it depends mainly on uh, conversational interaction between two. So if the, this conversation is happening between two learners, then it is very difficult to give corrective feedback. When the learner is having a conversation with a native speaker or a profession speaker of the language, then this profession speaker can give him uh, the correct uh, structure. So he can correct his errors. But if both of them are learners, then it is very difficult to give a corrective feedback. So they don't help each other much. Uh, corrective feedback, for example, recaps, we looked at different corrective feedback last class. Uh, so corrective feedback in conversational interaction can help learners in terms of their accuracy and development of language forms. Okay, but when do they get good corrective feedback? It's when they have a conversation with someone who is proficient in the language or he is a native speaker. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions, ladies? Okay, so let's move to uh, up the proposal number four. Uh, they call it get to for one. Okay, what do we mean by get to for one? Another name for this approach is called content-based language teaching, CBLT, content-based language teaching. How do they do that? Learners acquire a second language or a foreign language as they study subject matter taught in that language. Right. This is exactly how it's done with international schools today. Here in Saudi Arabia, we have this trend of international schools. What they do, they don't, they don't teach English as a language, but they teach other subjects in English. So they teach mathematics, geography, science, uh, all the different subjects. They teach it in English. Okay? So they don't teach the language itself. They teach a subject in that language. So types of CBLT include immersion, content and language integrative learning, and bilingual education. So what we have in international schools here is the bilingual uh, education. Okay, immersion is when they just uh, they immerse the learner in the second language. So uh, they, um, just like when someone who doesn't speak English go to study in uh, a UK university, okay, so, or, or a US university. So they are immersed in the language immediately, okay. Um, the content and language integrated uh, learning um, this is like in most of the international schools where they teach the subject in uh, the second language. 
so they are cooperated together. They are learning the subject, they are learning science and English at the same time. Okay, and bilingual education, where you have, um, they teach um, some subjects in English and other subjects in Arabic. So they have bilingual, they teach um, in both languages, in L1 and L2. Again, there was a number of research done to evaluate how effective is this method, GIT 2 for 1. Is it really good for teaching second language? Uh, so um, they looked at French immersion programs in Canada, uh, late immersion under stress in Hong Kong, uh, dual immersion, um, in with children in content-based uh, programs. And you can see that most of them are uh, recent, okay? We have only two uh, that are a little bit old, but 2002 and 2009. So this is the recent um, research. Okay, so is it really effective? According to the research, they found out that there are advantages and disadvantages to this uh, approach. So the advantages is that it increases the amount of exposure to L2. So instead of having only one class in English, they're having all the class in English, all the classes in English. So there is, remember one of the problem with the uh, classroom settings is that the, the, the time is limited for teaching the language. Here they have big exposure to L2, so they are listening to the language for a long time. Um, another advantage is that it creates a genuine need to communicate. Okay, uh, again, one of the problems with the classroom settings is that you, the learner is not forced to use the language because he can always use L1 to communicate with um, everyone else. But here, it pushes the, the learner um, to communicate in L2 because this is the only language he has around. Uh, another advantage is that it's cognitively challenging. It challenges the mental abilities of the learner. So uh, mentally, um, he's processing a lot. Okay. But Still, there are some problems with uh, this content-based language teaching. Uh, the problem is that the children need many years to acquire language for cognitively challenging academic material. Yes, Afnan, you should know all the proposals and how, effect how effective they are, the advantages and disadvantages of each one, okay? So, the problem with uh, the content-based language teaching is that children take a long time to acquire the language. Why? Because they are not only studying the language, they are studying academic material with it, okay? So, uh, the effort here is too much. They, they have to pay big effort to learn both. That's why instead of acquiring the language, let's say, in three, four years, they need like eight, ten years to be uh, profession speakers of the language. Okay? So it takes long years. And you can notice that if you know any one of the children studying in the international schools, they reach uh, they finish the primary school and they're still not using the in, uh, English correctly. They still uh, not fully developed as speakers of English. Okay, uh, another problem is that in content-based language teaching, both language and content must be attended to. So it's difficult. It's difficult for the children to do that because they have to pay attention to the subject and they have to pay attention to the language at the same time, okay? All right, now let's move to um, 
the following proposal and they call it teach what is teachable. Uh, this approach was based on um, Feynman in 1988 and, and his colleagues. They had uh, different suggestions about teaching second language. Uh, they suggested that some aspects of language are best taught according to learners' internal schedule. Um, in other words, developmental features. So they look at this, the learners, they see where they are exactly, and then they teach them what they need. Okay. Uh, other aspects of language can be taught at any time. So there's no specific time for the learners to, to get these features. Instruction cannot change the natural developmental course. So no matter how hard you try to, to teach uh, the learner a certain concept in the language, if they are not ready uh, naturally to acquire it, then you cannot teach it uh, to them. Uh, the last point is that it's important to assess learners' development and teach what would naturally come next. So teaching should follow the natural acquisition of language aspects. Okay, again, applying this approach, some research was done to uh, evaluate uh, how effective it is. So, um, uh, Pineman did a study called Ready to Learn, and then Ready's, Unready's, and Recast, uh, Developmental Stage and First Language Influence. Okay, so how successful is that? Uh, approach. They found that targeting instruction to developmental stages can be beneficial. So it can, it is beneficial somehow. But other factors need to be taken into concentration. We should also take care of the type of instructional input. So there must be more focus instruction, either more explicit instruction or recast focused on single language feature resulted in progress by ready learners. Learners first language is another factor that affects their development because patterns of L1 may prevent generalization of an L2 pattern even if learners are developmentally ready. Okay, so um, let me just say this in another way. This approach depends on uh, knowing what uh, the learner already knows. Okay? So, let's say, if the learner already acquired the past tense ED and he can use it correctly, then if he is at that stage, then he is ready to learn the irregular um, past tense of the verb, okay? So you never teach the irregular unless you make sure that the learners already learned the um, ED past regular, okay? So is it effective in teaching the language? Yes, it is beneficial, but the, the benefit is limited. Why? Because there are other factors that can affect the learning process. One of them is the type of instructional input. So we have to be careful about how we teach, how we teach this uh, concept of the language. There must be more focused in instruction, uh, whether it was explicit or implicit, uh, that can help the learners to progress if they are ready. <coughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, another factor that affects the progress in, in language is the learner's first language. Because sometimes interference from uh, L1 will affect their development, their development in L2. So we can say that it's partially uh, effective. All right, the last proposal is what is called get it right in the end. Okay, remember the first proposal was get it right from the beginning. Okay, but now they believe that learners should get it right in the end. Okay, so um, researchers or uh, developers of this proposal suggest that not everything has to be taught. Lots of language can be acquired naturally with sufficient exposure. So we don't teach the learner every aspect of the language. Okay? So some aspects of the language must be taught and may need to be taught explicitly. Okay? But there are other aspects of language can be taught by helping learners to notice certain features in the input and to increase their awareness of form. So, some part of the language should be taught explicitly and very clearly and directly. And there are other aspects of the language that should not be taught explicitly, but with the input that is given to the learner, he should notice the different forms, the different structures, and naturally he will be able to acquire those. So with the instructions on some of the aspects and noticing some other aspects by himself, the learner eventually, at the end, he will develop a good language. Okay, again, they evaluated, they do, they've done so many research to evaluate how effective this approach is. Um, one of them is form focus experiments in ESL, focusing on gender in French emergent, focusing on social linguistics, social linguistic forms in French emergent, focusing on verbs in content based science classroom. Okay, so what's the, the result? What did they find? Okay, and more research, you can see. Um, recast and prompts, focus on forms through collaborative dialogue, focus on form and task-based instruction, the timing of form focus instruction. So, um, so many research was done till 2012. So this is the most recent, it's the most modern approach of teaching uh, the language. So what was the result? of uh, using this approach. So they found that form focused, all right, get it, at, get it in the end, it's called the form focused instruction or the form focused approach. So the form focused instruction and corrective feedback within communicative and content based language teaching can help learners improve their knowledge and use of language forms. You can see here that this proposal is using more than one approach at the same time. So, they use instructions, direct clear instructions, they use corrective feedback, they use communication, and they use content-based language teaching. So, they are not saying don't use these other proposals. You can use them, but with that, you can improve the language process. So they found that long-term effects of instruction may be related to whether there is continued exposure to the language feature after instruction ends. So the exposure to language and to the same forms that were taught can affect 
the development of the language. Teachers are not the only source of information about language forms. So students can help each other to reflect the language form if given adequate guidance. So it should not be only the teacher who is uh, giving guy giving instructions all the time or giving information all the time, but the students themselves can help each other to notice the form and to correct each other with the teacher just to guide them through the process. Uh, the form focus instruction also uh, may be more effective for some features than others. So it works very well with some features of the language, but sometimes they don't work as well uh, with other features. Uh, also, the form focus instruction may be essential for some features. So it is very important to use it with certain um, features, especially the ones that make misleading similarities between L1 and L2. So in the areas where there are similarities in L1 and L2, the form-focused instruction is very effective. Okay, again, um, there are two types of form-focused instruction. One that is called isolated and integrated. Isolated are the ones that are directly and explicitly uh, taught. The integrated, the ones that the learner uh, with guidance will notice them from uh, the input. They lead to different kinds of knowledge. So there is a need for more research that measures implicit as well as explicit knowledge. So the overall context of learning interacts with the type of instruction and corrective feedback. So they have to use the right type of instruction with the certain aspects that uh, go with it. Okay? So the type of instruction should meet the needs of certain concepts in the language. Okay, you can see that there are so many um, advantages to this approach, which is get it right at the end. Now, let's summarize and look at all the different proposals that we looked at till now. All right, so get it right from the beginning. Is it good or not? So evidence suggests that this approach does not correspond to the way that majority of successful L2 learners have acquired their proficiency. So it is not successful. The first one, did it right from the beginning? This is not a successful approach. Okay, number two, just listen and read and get two for one. Okay, so we're talking about two approaches at the same time. There is no support for the hypothesis that language acquisition will take care of itself if L2 learners focus exclusively on meaning or content. So again, it is, they are not proven to be effective. Just listen and read and get two for one. Both of them are not proven to be effective. Okay, let's talk. The proposal of let's talk, where there are conversational interactions in group and paired activities can lead to increased fluency and the ability to manage conversations in the L2. So it is effective in one area. The proposal of let's talk is, yes, uh, one and two are not good. I'll go back. Number one, get it right from the beginning. This is not effective at all. This is a very old method. No one uses now, and it does not help. It, it's not good for teaching second language. Okay. Just listen and read. Get two for one. Remember, get two for one. 
this is what is going on in the international schools now, which is a big trend in Saudi Arabia these days. Well, again, there is no support for this hypothesis. Both of these hypotheses are not effective. There is no proof that they are not they are effective. They are still being used, but um, it, they don't show um, success in teaching second language. Okay, now they still use it. I don't know. They believe it's working, but actually it's not. It will just produce children who are not speaking English well and they are not speaking Arabic well. Most of the times this is the result. They are lost between the two languages. Uh, plus, they don't understand the material well. Uh, there is a study done on children who learn mathematics and science in their own language in L1 and another group of children who are studying mathematics and science in the second language, they found that there is a huge difference in their understanding of the material. That's why in Singapore, they used to teach in public schools, they used to teach mathematics and science in English for 10 years. But after 10 years, they stopped and they started teaching them in their own language because they found that it's, it's uh, not a good uh, thing to do. Okay, so um, now we said these three are not good. Now let's look at the other three proposals. Let's talk that concentrate on conversations and interaction. It is effective, it is good in the fluency and the ability to manage conversations in the L2. So it is good for speaking. The learners will be able to have conversations with fluent language in L2. Okay? However, learners may make slow progress, progress on acquiring more accurate and sophisticated language if there is no focus on form. So if they only, if they kept concentrating on conversation and speaking, they will be very fluent in conversation but they will not very developed, they don't develop a sophisticated, a high level of language use. Okay, how is that? Because they concentrate on everyday conversation, but they don't concentrate on form, which is, let's say, literary reading, uh, very formal kinds of reading and writing, like, um, you know, when you are talking about um, a literary book or a scientific book or maybe, um, you know, the way they present the news, they don't use the everyday words. There are some sophisticated words used in that form of the language. So, learners who are using um, this approach or this proposal to study the second language, they would be good in everyday conversation, but they will not reach this sophisticated high level of language use, okay? So this is particularly the case in classes where learners share the same first language and learning background, okay? So let's talk is partially effective. Okay, it's, it's not effective in all the aspects of language, it's partially effective. Okay, now let's look at the approach of teach what is teachable. Okay, there is no strong evidence that teaching according to learners' developmental level is necessary or desirable or that it will lead to long-term benefits. So the benefit of that approach is not proven. Okay, they've done so many research, but till now, it's not proven that it's effective. The most valuable feature about this proposal is that it helps teachers set realistic expectations about the way learners' interlanguage may change in response to instruction, 
and that progress does not always appear as increased accuracy. So the only benefit of that or the most valuable, the most important thing about this approach is that the teacher would have a real expectation of what is the level of the student's uh, proficiency in L2. Are they developing or not? What, uh, on what level exactly they are? Okay, so they might be progressing or improving, but it doesn't mean that it will. They will reach uh, an accurate usage of the language. Okay, now uh, let's look at the last. Uh, proposal, which is the most modern way of teaching the language, to get it right in the end. Well, there is strong evidence that form-focused instruction within the context of a communicative and content-based language teaching is more effective in promoting L2 learning than instructional approaches that are limited to an exclusive emphasis on accuracy, comprehension, or interaction. Okay, let's say this again. So there is strong evidence to prove that this approach is the most effective way of teaching second language. Why? Because they are not teaching everything and uh, they only concentrate on the aspects that are important to be taught explicitly and they give the space or they give uh, good input to the learner to notice by himself and to process by himself the things that he can do uh, naturally. Okay? So it is the most effective method till now. Okay. Decisions about balancing form focus and meaning focus must take into account differences in learners' characteristics. So one of the things that the teacher should pay attention to is um, the different characteristics of the learners. What is the age? What is the goal of the learning? Um, um, their personalities, uh, their uh, technique for or they way, their way of learning. If they took all this in consideration, um, it would be more effective than anything else. Okay, so to summarize all this, we can say it is not necessary or desirable to choose between form-based and meaning-based instruction. The challenge is to find the best balance between these two orientations. So we do not concentrate on the rules and the structures of the language, um, that they have to use the language correctly, and we don't concentrate mainly on getting the meaning. So as long as they are giving the meaning, then no problem, even if they made mistakes. Well, we have to find the balance between these two to teach the, the learners how to use the language correctly and how to give the meaning correctly. Okay. Many questions about L2 teaching remain to be answered by classroom-based research on L2 learning. So um, L2 teaching or uh, teaching a second language uh, is a very active field in linguistics where more studies and more research is is going on all the time trying to improve the way we teach second language. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this course. Um, so you have six chapters to be included, uh, inshallah, uh, in the final. Any questions, ladies? Any questions?
Okay. So I hope everything is clear. Um, for the final exam, um, most of the questions will be uh, multiple choice, uh, fill in the blanks, um, uh, very short answers. I'm not going to ask you to write like an essay, uh, but um, there will be short answers. Okay. Uh, just concentrate on the summaries that you have in the, uh, the slides, and if you needed, um, if you need more explanation, of course, uh, the book is there. Yes, definitions. You should know uh, the definitions that we came across um, in this course. Anything else you want to know? If you understand everything in this slide, yes, you can. But you need the book to understand the, the summary that you have in the slides. Okay, um, the problem is I cannot give you the, uh, I will not be here next class. So there is no class um, on Thursday. I have a conference, uh, so I'm not going to be free. Uh, I will see if I can, ha if we can have an extra class on Saturday maybe. Okay, I will let you know. I'll send you a message uh, if we are having um, another class. Well, of course you can contact me through uh, email all the time and you can also send me messages uh, through uh, my KAU app. Do you have my KAU app? This is the quickest way to, uh, to ask me um, for something. You, you better download um, you better download the, the, the app, my KAU app. It's a very quick way of sending uh, a short message uh, to me. Uh, or you can email me. Or you can just uh, send me a message here on the Blackboard. OK? Yeah, the app on the phone. Yes. OK, so uh, my email is Okay, so this is my email, mmandlui at kau.edu.sa. You can email me to ask me about anything. Um, or you can pass by, if you want, uh, to my office. You can drop um, by my office. It's in a Johara building, room 132. A Johara building, room 132. My office hours are Sundays and Tuesdays from 11 to 12. Sundays and Tuesdays from 11 to 12. OK. Can I help you with something else? The glossary, what do you mean? Which glossary? Uh, at the end of the book? Well, not everything uh, there uh, you, you're supposed to, to know. Well, uh, there are some important uh, terms that we discussed here. 
um, in the classes, we have something like interlanguage. You should know what is uh, what is interlanguage. Uh, you have something like corrective feedback. Uh, no, not dates. You don't. You don't need to understand. You, you don't need to memorize dates. Um, okay, something like corrective feedback. Something like fossilization. Okay, so there are key terms that you should know the meaning. The glossary um, is a very quick way uh, to find the definition of these terms. Okay, so of course you can use it. But it doesn't mean that you have to memorize everything there. Actually, you don't have to memorize the, the definition. If you understand what it means, that's enough. You don't have to memorize it word by word. So you have something like form-focused instruction, grammar translation, all these uh, key terms that we talked about uh, are the ones that you should know. No essay questions, they are short answer questions. Something that goes for uh, four to five lines maximum, not essay questions. You're welcome. Any more questions? Anyone? Okay, thank you everyone. It's Tawfiq, inshallah. Um, wish you all the best. And I will see you, inshallah, later.